Hey everybody, what's up and welcome back. If you're new here, I'm Liz and today we're going to be starting this week of the 27 Club. If you don't know what the 27 Club is, basically it is people who died at the age of 27 that are celebrity, musicians, actors, all of the above, artists. And today we're going to be talking about Kristen Pfaff. Now, Kristen Pfaff was born on May 26, 1967 in Buffalo, New York. She was born to Janet Pfaff in her first hub, husband, which is Mike Parco, which is Kristen Pfaff's actual last name. So her dad comes from a family of very successful musicians. Her parents ended up divorcing when she was a child, though, and her mom ended up remarrying marrying to a man, Norman Pfaff, of which adopted Kristen, and that's where she gets her actual last name, Pfaff. So she also has two younger brothers, um, one of which is a musician. His name is Jason Pfaff. Um, and Kristen ended up studying classical piano and cello. So she ended up graduating from the Catholic School Buffalo Academy of Sacred Heart in 1985. And she ended up spending a short time in Europe before attending Boston College. But she ended up finishing her degree at the University of Minnesota, where she majored in women's studies. Uh, there is where she worked as a counselor for rape victims. And she also was a part of a sexual violence program um, in restoring this program in itself, which offered a crisis line and counseling services for people that need it and also training in self-defense. So Kristen took a part of the annual 24-hour rape-free zone in 1990, and she was quoted as saying the goal was to draw attention to violence, especially violence against women on campus and in the world. So it's during this time where she participated in college radio, which was on a station called Radio K, and she can be heard on this station in a short clip that is actually available on SoundCloud. So while she's living in Minneapolis, she taught herself how to play the bass guitar. Her Joachim Brewer, who was formerly of the band The Bastards in Minneapolis, and the drummer Matt Ensminger formed the band Janitor Joe in 1991. So their first song, Himong, was released in 1992. Later that year, they released Bullet Head, which was then followed in 1993 with Boyfriend, and then the debut album Big Metal Birds. So there's a track called Under the Knife that can also be found on an OXO Records four-track EP that was released in 1993. So, Janitor Joel became a staple in Minneapolis, and it was influenced by the Pacific Northwest's very, like, early grungy sound, which is what's very much known with the 90s. 90s music was gangster rap, rap hip-hop, and grunge rock. That's what it was. That was the early 90s. And then it just like fused into like boy bands and girl bands and oh my god, I'm pretty and all of like the cutesy stuff at the end. But and very like dance. It was very grunge and rap. That was the 90s. So this sound was sharper and it was very like it was faster than a DC post hardcore scene that was happening. And as well as like the distortion that the butthole surfers had and big black and other bands that were on the touch and go label. So Faf's playing style was central to uh, janitor Joe's assault, like both live and on record her and Brewer both contributed to big metal birds is both. They both operate with an easy reach of like the line separating punish punishment and reward. Kristen, uh, her contributions tend to be more slightly more spacious, while Brewers stipulate that their drummer um, maintain a perpetual motion. So their, their sound was very unique because Kristen was hardcore on her bass, and then we have Brewer, who was relentless, and then we have Matt Ensminger, who just had to maintain that rhythm to make sure that they all sound good together. Because that's really what it is. Your bass and your drum go together, and then you have your guitarist or your rhythm guitarist that really, like, 
carry the melody of what you're trying to portray. So the Minneapolis scenes was growing and it was attracting the music press attention in 1993. So Amphetamine Reptile, which was another band, they released a tour single called Stinker and Janitor Joe began, uh, began to tour nationally with them. And it was on one tour in California where Kristen was scouted by Eric Erlandson and Courtney Love from Hull, who at the time were looking for a new bassist. Now, Courtney invited Kristen to play with Hull. Kristen declined and then she returned to Minneapolis, but she was relentlessly pursued by Courtney Love and Erlandson. So... Initially, she didn't want to leave Minneapolis and join Hull, but after she reconsidered this with the advice from her dad, Norman, um, who said that from a professional point of view, there was no decision made, like you should go. Um, he later told Seattle Weekly that because they are already on Geffen Records and already have this huge following in England, if you want to keep moving up the ladder, that's how you do it. So... Although her mom, Janet, didn't want her to leave Minneapolis and Janitor Joe, she ended up becoming on board with Kristen moving and going to Seattle and joining Hull. So following the critical acclaim of their first album, Pretty on the Inside, Hull ended up getting a great deal from a major label interest, which they signed with Geffen Records for a reported $3 million, and that was for an eight-album deal. So Kristen ended up moving to Seattle in 1993, where she worked with the other members of Hole on Live Through This, which was the major label follow-up for Pretty on the Inside. Now, the new lineup for the band was Courtney Love, Eric Erlinson, Kristen Pfaff, and Patty Schmidt. Schemel, 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 Patty Schemel on drums. So they went into the studio in early 1993 and they began rehearsals. And that's when everything really took off. And because of Kristen joining Hull, that's when they became a real band. That's how they felt. So her time in Seattle was during a creative rich period. She had relationships with Eric Erlinson and Kurt Cobain and while they worked on the album Live Through This, Kristen and Eric dated, and they stayed together for most of 1993, and they remained close even after they split up. But all wasn't well. Washington was heroin's capital at the time, and Kristen ended up follow, like developing a problem with drug use. Everybody was doing it at the time. All of your friends were, were junkies. Everyone was doing it. It was ridiculous, and everything in the town was covered in dope, basically. Um, Courtney Love, this is what Courtney Love said about the Seattle music scene at the time. Uh, most accounts state that Kristen's own drug use was moderate. Like, she dabbled in drugs before she was in the band in Minneapolis, but it was very light. Um, Eric ended up telling Craig Marks of Spin that she moved to Seattle and felt disconnected from everything. She made friends and drug connections, which he told her not to do. And the only way to survive in this town is if you don't make those connections. But even with the critical acclaim for Live Through This, Kristen ended up deciding to move back to Minnesota, partly because of her drug problem and partly because of the creative differences in whole. So when she was back in Minneapolis, she ended up going to a detox center for heroin addiction in February of 1994, and she left Hull later that spring. She ended up going on tour with Janitor Joe, and when she was on tour and when she came back from that, she was clean. That's what Eric Erland said. And now in the wake of Kurt Cobain's death, which happened in April of 1994, Kristen, this is when Kristen decided to leave Hull, was right after his death. And she made the return to Minneapolis permanent. Then she toured with Janitor, Janitor Joe. However, Kristen made plans to return to Seattle in order to retrieve the rest of her belongings. And she made the trip back to Seattle on June 14th of 1994. But sadly, at 9.30 a.m. on June 16th of 1994, Kristen was found dead in her apartment by Paul Erickson, who was a friend of which she planned to leave Minneapolis with that day. She was only 27 years old. 
Now, on the floor was a bag that contained syringes and drug paraphernalia. Kristen's death was attributed to acute opioid intoxication, and she died two months after Kurt Cobain did, who was her close friend and as well as Courtney Love's husband. Now, her father, Norman, said that Kristen was a very bright, personable, wonderful, and very talented person who was very smart, and she always seemed to be in control of her circumstances, and last night she wasn't in control. Now, in the book Love and Death, which was released in 2004, um, her mother, Janet, stated that she n was never accepted, she never accepted the official story of her daughter's death, and that um, Janet was interviewed again by authors Wallace and Halperin in August of 2003 in, in regards to how she felt. Now, Eric Erlinson was the last person to see Kristen alive before she overdosed on heroin. And he would later admit saying that, I admit I made some stupid mistakes with some people and people are dead because of my stupid mistakes. That's what I want to say. And I want to use that so that other people don't make the same mistakes that I made. And other people start understanding. I get emotional about this. We've all lost people. So there was definitely a period of mourning after she died. They ended up recruiting Melissa off Demur um, and dedicated Hole's first show back with their new bassist. They dedicated the new show to Kristen. The compilation in 1987, My Body, The Hand Grenade, is also dedicated to Kristen Pfaff. On October 20th of 1994, just a few months after she passes, Janet Pfaff accepted an induction on her daughter's behalf to the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame, where she said, I'm proud to accept this award for Kristen. I know she would be happy to receive it, it's sad because Kristen wasn't here to enjoy the moment herself. You work so hard in the business to make it to a national level like she did. I just wish she was here to enjoy it and to see her hometown and how her hometown feels about her. There's also a local radio station called uh, KUOM, which is the University of Minnesota's radio station that started a yearly memorial scholarship in her name, which is about $1,000. And the award is earmarked for individuals active in the arts in the pursuit of their educational goals. Now, portions of the proceeds of Hull's album sales have gone to the Kristen Pfaff Memorial Fund as well. There is a book about her life and her work as an activist and a, as a musician um, that was written by Guy Mankowski and Sarah Sarah, Haas, or Sarah Howie's Roberts. I Know How to Live the Story of Kristen Pfaff. And it draws from Kristen's archive of her work. Um, and it has a forward by her brother, Jason. So that, my friends, is the life and death of Kristen Pfaff, who is a very, very influential person in 90s music. But I hope you guys enjoyed, and I will see you guys tomorrow in another video.